The Girl from Catholic School My story happened in 2013. For some context, I was staying in my grandparents' home, which was over a hundred years old, in South Africa. I had experienced other unexplainable occurrences, like waking up one night to have my rosary wrapped around my neck, choking me. This event had left ligature marks around my neck. The strange part is that I had slept in a rosary for years, and I had never had anything like this happen. Other strange things that went on were doors opening on their own, the kind of doors that have handles that require twisting to open. The story I'm telling you today centers around this old house. My grandparents decided to sell it, as they were both in their 70s. In 2013, I was alone at home with our housekeeper as I was studying. The real estate agent showed up to the house unannounced. I opened up for her and out stepped an older Muslim woman. With this woman were two little girls dressed in uniforms that matched the Catholic primary school I had attended many years prior. The one girl had the same fair complexion as her mother. The other girl was definitely Indian and not Arabic. I found this kind of strange, but I figured she was probably just a school friend. I welcomed them into the house and they looked around. As the agent and the guests made their way upstairs, the little girl who appeared to be Indian stared at me as her hand trailed along the banister. Then I went to go unlock the other home on the property where my uncle stayed with his family. Right behind me were the two little girls. They rushed into the house and made their way into my cousin's bedroom. The Indian girl was sitting on the bed, petting the cat who was fast asleep, and the other girl was looking around at some toys in the room. I told the girl on the bed that the cat usually doesn't really like people touching her and that she's lucky. The girl just smiled at me. Finally, the parent and the agent arrived at the flat on the property where we were, so I stepped outside to give them some space. Once they had finished, they thanked me, and the agent, the mother, and the lighter-skinned girl, who I had assumed was her daughter, had stepped outside. I paused for a moment, and eventually asked the real estate agent if she could please call the other girl to come outside so that I could lock up. The mother and the agent looked at me, puzzled. What other girl? They asked. The mom said, I only brought my daughter. I laughed at them and told them that I don't really have time to joke around because I really did need to study for my final exams. Their faces fell. I could now see that they were not kidding. I rushed into my cousin's bedroom, only to find it empty, apart from the cat still sound asleep on the bed. I tried to compose myself as I said goodbye to the real estate agent and the prospective buyer. After they left, I asked the housekeeper if she had seen who got out of the car. She responded that it was just two women and a little girl. I know that I did not imagine this, because I clearly saw her. She had thick black hair cut into a bob, and she had a blue Alice band. The way she smiled at me. This experience still haunts me to this day. I don't know if it was an apparition that followed the little girl from school, and maybe knew that I also attended that school. Maybe that's why she showed herself to me. I really don't know. I have never come up with a good explanation for what that was. In a small town in South Africa named Pilgrim's Rest, ghost stories are ever prominent amongst the locals. One school holiday, I went to visit some family who had an old gable house on the outskirts of town. Being gifted with the ability to speak with the dead, I loved going there. I would sit in the fields or near the old railway, as they would show me flashbacks of the town's early days. But that holiday, 
something terrible was shown to me. Terrible to the point that I have never returned to the town. Not because I don't want to, but more because I'm not wanted. See, I discovered a dark secret of that town, and what I saw left a scar. I was out on my usual night walk, through the old children's cemetery which was established during a plague. Most of the graves remained unmarked, but all the years of death say 1886. I loved watching the kids play under the full moon, but then I saw them, the miners. They were walking from a part of the forest that I was told was off limits, but they looked sad. They looked as if they were forgotten. The next day I went into that part of the forest, and eventually after about a two hour hike, I found the miners again. Approaching slowly, I made them aware that I could see them, and that's when they told me the story of their gruesome death. Back in those days, witchcraft and curses still scared people, and the founding families had been brainwashed into believing that the reason the plague hit the town so hard was because they were mining on sacred ground. But instead of following the right procedures to stop mining, they just decided to collapse the mine right on top of all 50 miners. They claimed that it was an accident and then proceeded to leave the miners buried under the rubble and erased from history. So this story might be a bit long, but it sure was a fun one. For me personally, anyway, as I rather enjoy these kinds of things. I come from a very religious family, and a lot of us have had paranormal encounters. My grandmother's house was haunted by someone who apparently hung themselves in the backyard many years before they even built the house. To this day, they frequently have priests come in and bless every room in the house. So many of my family members have been able to see things that the regular eye cannot, including me from a young age, when I used to see things in my house, which once even drove me to run into a locked door hard enough to get a concussion. That's another story for another day. Anyway, this story takes place around late October of last year. I am a student at Stellenbosch University in South Africa, so most of my friends lived in their own flats around campus, and my one friend, Bianca, had lived in a small one-person flat that was really quiet and small, basically a long hallway of a room leading onto a balcony. So we all used to hang out in her room while listening to music, playing Uno, drinking beer, and getting really stoned until early in the morning, as all good students do. We had this game that we called the universe game, where you basically just ask the universe a question, and she had this mega playlist of songs, so she would put it on ultimate shuffle, and whatever song would play after the question would be the universe's answer, whatever interpretation you took from it and worked for you. So there had been a couple of nights where we'd been hanging out, and the lights would just start to flicker in weird beats. Now, my friends didn't know at the time that I could feel these kinds of things coming, before and as they happened, so they just dismissed it as the switch just freaking out a little bit. But this kept on happening more and more each day, until one night, we were all playing the game again, and when the answer came, the lights acted up again. This time, we looked over to the light switch, and saw a faded white hand at the switch, just the hand flicking the switch. It just disappeared and the lights went back to normal. At this point, everyone was freaking out, but I was really just kind of excited by it. For some reason, it just didn't feel like a threatening presence. It was oddly playful to me. I kept this to myself and just played along with everyone else's reactions. So, one night a few weeks after that, my friends were all out of town, and I had a key to my friend's place. I decided I would go over there and stay for a few nights, just to hang out and draw on my favorite couch. 
It all went smoothly, and I was actually getting some nice work done. I had been playing the universe game a lot throughout this time, and this one night close to 3 a.m., I was drawing and playing the game. I decided to go onto YouTube to find a random playlist to mix things up, because I don't know, I'm a rebel like that. So I find one. I ask a couple of questions and things go smoothly, and as I'm drawing, I suddenly just get a weird surge of energy through me, and at the same time the lights start going bananas. I look down at my phone, and the song playing is called Ghost. I had not smoked nearly enough to make that up, or to see that. Anyway, I jumped up and looked around to see whatever was going on, but as usual, it ended as soon as it started. I must say that this was one of the more pleasant experiences I had ever had in this line of things, and I'm not even getting into my sleep paralysis and night terrors. I've experienced a lot of strange things, but like I said, this one was actually pretty cool, and I thought I would share. Today, I went to the same place I've been twice before. I mean, exactly the same place, identical in every way. The thing is, every time I've been there, it's in a different state. The first time, I was in Alabama, off Highway 10, between the state line and Mobile in 2012. The second time was off Highway 55 in Mississippi, north of Batesville in 2015. This time, it was in Tennessee, off Highway 65 near Spring Hill. I have moved around a bit, and I've definitely gotten a sense of deja vu before, but that's not what this was. I mean this place is the same in every single way. The same long, curving exit off of three different highways, a left turn at a desolate three-way stop, leading to a small, single-story building on the right side of the road. The building doesn't look that old. Definitely a newer construction, but there's nothing really else around it other than trees and farmland. The lobby is the same. The furniture and its layout are the same. When brought back to an office, it feels like it wasn't really meant to be an office because there are three doors. The one we enter through, and then two behind me leading to other parts of the building that I can't really see much of. Maybe a copy room and a break room or something. On the desk, there's the same pink stapler on the corner. The same garbage can that looks out of place along the wall between the two doors. The only thing that's ever different are the people. The first time in Alabama, it was a staffing company that I was interviewing with. It stood out because it felt so out of place. I had never been in that area before. I was 100% sure I was lost and about to be the main character of a true crime show. The second time, in Mississippi, it was an occupational therapist that I was sent to see because of a work-related disability. It felt very eerie, but I chalked up all the similarities to coincidence. I mean, how else do you rationalize that? Today was the third time, in Tennessee and it was a legal office. I had an appointment with a lawyer for a consultation over some financial matters. As soon as I walked in the door, I was ready to leave. This was no longer just a coincidence. I knew I had been there before. For the third time, everything was exactly the same. Only the people were different. I have never been more uncomfortable in my life. The whole thing felt wrong in every way. I got the meeting over with as soon as possible, and I will never go back there again. But who knows when I might walk into that building once more. Just somewhere else. Has anyone ever experienced this? Is it some kind of a glitch? I'd really love some answers.
East Tennessee is known for its ghost stories and storytelling in general, as is common in Appalachian culture. The Cherokee felt connected to the region spiritually, and the Europeans that replaced them have too. Just look up the legend of the Wampus Cat sometime. Here's my own set of stories, all in relation to Johnson City, as I am originally from that area. In college, before any of my friend group could drink, we got wild hairs and decided to go ghost busting, as we called it. This usually involved us loading up into a vehicle and cruising through the hollows and hills of East Tennessee. We had done our research, be it on the internet or in local ghost story books, and found quite a few places to explore. The first of which I'll mention is the Exit 27 ramp off of I-26 near Irwin. Legend has it that a group of high schoolers were killed by a driver while coming off the ramp one night, many decades ago, after prom. Now their spirits watch the ramp, pushing vehicles back up the ramp and away from the bisecting road. I can personally attest to this experience. If you go at night, and there usually isn't any other traffic, you can stop your car on the bottom of the ramp and put it in neutral. Doing so will make your car roll back up the ramp. The second place is also near Irwin. It's called Bumpus Cove. From what I can remember, there were several stories about this place, including a Confederate cemetery with ghosts. We could never find it, and the GPS kept taking us to a house. Those poor people. We did, however, find a family cemetery with a paved road around it. Legend had it that if you drove around this cemetery on a full moon three times, a ghost jeep would chase you down the mountain. This cemetery was very isolated and near the Cherokee National Forest. I don't think we ever managed to do this on a full moon. We still got scared, though. Since the cemetery sat on a hill, we would see illuminated crosses poking up around the graves. Under a night sky, it's pretty horrifying, even if it's not overtly paranormal. The third story I will share is of the Job Cemetery in downtown Irwin. The cemetery is located in town, but sinks down into a creek and heavily forested area. I believe at the back end there's a large, or once was a large, railroad yard. Well, legend has it that the ghost of a murderous homeless person, who apparently was killed in a brawl in Irwin, haunts the cemetery. We explored the cemetery numerous times, but never saw much once again. It was very creepy and unsettling to go back down into the back of the cemetery, so close yet so far away from the living world. Another story we found was about an abandoned old house called Gwendolyn's House, which sits off Bristol Highway between Piney Flats and Elizabethan. This house was allegedly haunted, and tales of it can be found, or could be found when we looked years ago, on topics. I don't really know the backstory, but we went to it on several occasions and got scared out of our minds. The house sat on a one-lane road, possibly called Kuntz Road or something, and was literally falling in. Two people in our group were brave enough to check it out, but another guy and I stayed in the car. The one in the car with me was a friend who boasted about believing in ration and logic and obviously didn't believe in ghosts. Well, he ended up having a panic attack in the car and swore he was seeing an old lady in the upper story window, rocking in a chair, looking and pointing right at him. I think the most infamous ghost story of East Tennessee is the Sensabaw Tunnel, which last I checked was closed off to the public. Much information can be found about this online, and people can tell it better than me, so it's worth reading the backstory. The tunnel is haunted by the ghost of a person who abducted and drowned a child in the creek running through the tunnel about a hundred years ago. You can hear a baby cry in the tunnel, which we believe strongly we did on numerous occasions. An omen for death, at least in those parts, is a black dog. There was also a legend that we came across of a black dog roaming the highways. Well, one night after visiting the tunnel, we were driving out of the old back road that the tunnel was on, and I almost hit a black dog. This was a narrow, one-lane road, and it sat near the Holston River. 
The mist was up, and I couldn't see the dog until the last second. Luckily, it didn't get hit. It must have jumped out of the way at the last moment, or simply disappeared into thin air. But either way, East Tennessee is creepy. Not dear. For my college screenwriting class, we were split into groups, four students each for a group project. The assignment was to select a myth or legend to base a 10 to 15 page screenplay on. My group thought it would be interesting to choose a cryptid for the project rather than a well-known historical myth or legend. Our teacher cleared us for the idea and we started brainstorming. Of course, we didn't want to do the most well-known cryptids, like the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot, so we started looking up some lesser-known ones. One of the ones that somebody pitched was known as the Knot Deer, in some cases the Night Deer. According to people's stories, it looked almost exactly like a large deer, but something felt horribly off. Only when they drove away did they realize what was specifically wrong about it. Still, even before they understood exactly what was going on, every story mentioned the overwhelming sense of wrongness. Quoting someone else's personal account, quote, it was a deer in the way that a graveyard is a playground. You can treat it as such, I guess, but it won't feel the same, end quote. Lo and behold, after a bit of research, I found out it was located in North Carolina. Not only that, but it was just over an hour away. Just about every written or publicized story of the Knot Deer supposedly took place in Boone, North Carolina and its surrounding areas. I informed the group of what I had discovered and, being spontaneous as I am, told them I would be driving out to the location that very night. I figured I probably wouldn't come across anything, even though I was legitimately curious. At the very least, it was something interesting to do, and I'd be able to accurately describe the location and ambience of the area to the main screenwriter. I wasn't able to convince the other three members of my group to go with me. They all had their legitimate reasons, and since I made the decision to go so suddenly, I understood why none of them wanted to go with me on the trip. Still, I had nothing else to do that night, and I had been itching for more travel ever since the entire pandemic started. I filled my roommate in on everything and asked if he wanted to go with me. At first, he told me that he would just consider it. But as I was getting ready to go, he told me that he had decided to tag along. One of his main reasons for doing so was that he felt like he had to go with me. I shrugged it off, not thinking much of what he said. After filling up my car with some extra gas and buying a couple of snacks for the road, I plugged Boone, North Carolina into my GPS, and I headed out. My roommate and I were pretty relaxed for the majority of the ride there. We joked around, listened to all sorts of music through the radio and CD player, and had some of whatever snacks we had bought earlier. Eventually, we got close to Boone. That's when we started to feel like something was off. It wasn't a feeling strong enough to make us want to turn around, but it was worth mentioning to each other. When we got into the city, it was just about what we imagined. Gas stations, car dealerships, dollar stores, and small cafes. All of them were closed at the time with our arrival in Boone being at around 9.10 p.m., but all of them were well lit and unintimidating. My roommate told me that we should probably head back at about 9.30, and that he would let me know when that time came around. I agreed with him since I didn't want to spend too long searching for an experience. Needless to say, when we didn't come across anything by 9.30, he decided to let us keep going for another half hour. The clock in my car's dash had been broken for a while now, and I couldn't look at my phone while I was driving. 
so I was totally reliant on him for the time. Had I known that we were going to be driving in the area past 9.30, I probably would have mentioned it and turned around sooner. Had I done that, I would have completely missed the experience we ended up having. I'm still unsure whether or not that would have been a good thing. We ended up in Tennessee by 9.50. That's when things started to get really bad. At this point, we rarely came across any other cars on the highway. We took the first exit we saw and ended up driving along more mountainous, forested roads. This meant that there were lots of tall, dark trees, almost no streetlights, and twisting roads that forced you to slow down. My roommate said he started to feel bad about the whole situation, and I agreed wholeheartedly. Still, there was nowhere to turn, so we continued going straight, since that was really the only option for the time being. A few different times, we got a serious sense of dread, but usually that feeling disappeared by the time we got onto the next section of the road. There were a couple of times that the both of us had started to tear up, not because we were sad or upset, but because it felt so wrong to be there, like it was somewhere we were not supposed to be. The feeling of dread was very particular too. It wasn't feeling bad in the sense of depression or anxiety. The best way to describe it is just that sense of wrongness. It came in waves not sticking around for a long time, but not going away entirely either. By this point, my GPS had stopped working entirely. Both my roommate's phone and my phone said that they had full bars, but mine simply refused to connect to anything. Luckily, his GPS still worked fine, so he plugged in the directions for home. It continued taking us down that road for a while longer. The area started to become much more forested as we went on, and the road started to twist and turn much more than it had before. Basically, we had come across the exact area where you would expect a monster to be. We started to feel really, really bad. I don't think I can express the feeling well enough with words, but it was the worst we had felt so far. But we knew something wasn't right, We both felt like we just weren't supposed to be there, and we felt like we had to get out. Since my roommate started getting truly spooked, that put me on edge even more, since he never gets scared by anything. There wasn't much we could do about it, though. The GPS still wanted us to follow the road, so we both awaited its next directions, eager to get on the highway back home. The sense of dread still came and went with every other segment of road that we crossed. Eventually, the GPS wanted us to turn. My roommate told me to turn right on that road. I knew he meant to turn right onto the road and follow it straight ahead, but for some reason I figured we should just turn around and backtrack. I started slowing down, and we both started to feel the absolute worst we'd ever felt. Like, things are very wrong and something was about to happen. My roommate said that my eyes were glazed over, and I kept saying something along the lines of, I just need to turn around right here, over and over. The more I said it, the quieter I got, until it was just, I just need to turn around right here. Keep in mind that I am normally a fairly loud person, and I had been loud the entire drive up until this point. I pulled off onto a gravel dip on the side of the road. Along the gravel dip was a thin chicken wire fence, shiny and silver. Back on the road behind us was a wall of dirt and rock. We were surrounded by tall, dark trees that blocked most of the night sky. Even with the headlights on, it was very difficult to see far ahead. He said very forcefully that we couldn't stop and we needed to keep going because he felt really bad, but I wasn't listening to him. I wasn't quite processing what he was saying, and for some reason I was having a difficult time hearing him at all. After he realized he wasn't getting through to me, he broke into a literal shout and told me that we had to get out of there. We could not stop, and we could not go back that way. 
It took him using his road rage voice to snap me out of it and get me to speed down the road. The only word I can use to describe what I felt in that moment was absolute terror. Even as I was slowing down, I felt it get worse and worse until it was almost overwhelming. I only realized that after we had gotten out of the area and back onto the highway. As we passed through the area and started getting into the city again, the looming sense of dread started to fade away. By the time we got onto the main highway, we felt safe again. But in the moment that I pulled off onto the gravel dip on the road, where I had almost stopped the car entirely, that was the most terrifying experience I've ever had in my life. I would bet my life savings that had we turned around, we would have seen something that we never wanted to. Both of us admitted to tearing up as we drove off from that spot. I was much more shaken up than my roommate was, and it took me a little while to fully process what had actually happened. I think it's safe to say that even though I didn't explicitly see anything for myself, I found exactly what I was looking for. Back in the mid-80s, we were traveling through Tennessee on our way to visit friends in Texas. My mom was driving. I, a teenager at the time, was navigating by using a paper map. These were the days before cell phones and GPS. We made it past Nashville on I-40 pretty late at night. We're maybe an hour outside the city. I'm charting our progress, old school with pencil and paper. We pass an exit, and I mark it. A minute later, a summer thunderstorm hit. Visibility dropped to nothing. All traffic slowed to a crawl, and we decided to pull off at the next possible exit and just find a motel to spend the night, because there was no way we were making any significant progress in this storm. Slow, white-knuckle driving ensued. An exit loomed up on the right. No signage that we could see in the downpour, but we took it. At the top of the exit ramp, we turned right toward a brilliantly lit up gas station. The left turn was onto an overpass crossing I-40, no lights from that side of the interstate. At this point, we were on a dinky little road. To our right, there was the gas station, which we were rapidly passing. To our left and back behind some trees was what looked like a motel but you couldn't make out the sign very well in the rain. We drove past the gas station before we realized that the road just ended up ahead. The gas station was the only building on this side of the road. It went from one and a half lane paved to one lane gravel. We could only see a short way ahead. Tire track, dirt, and grass all over the space of maybe 20 yards. Now we were past the gas station, there was only one turnoff from this road and it was on our left. We took it and tried to back up and turn around to get back to the gas station. Unfortunately, the paved slope of that narrow, driveway-sized turnoff led steeply down into a huge mud pit. No backing up off of it. Mom put the car into low gear, turned hard, and headed back for the gravel road through the mud. We almost made it out, but we got mired. The front passenger tire caught on the corner of an exposed concrete storm drain, maybe three feet from the road. We got out of the car and into the rain and mud, and we walked to the gas station. The place was spotless, super bright, and had two young men behind the counter. What sounded like one of Elvis's songs was playing on the radio inside. The attendant's first words on seeing us walk in were, Did you get stuck in the mud? And they said it super enthusiastically, like a way too happy greeting. Like a Disney staffer welcoming you as you walked into the park for the very first time. That kind of happy to see you. Also, these night shift clerks were dressed in suits that looked about 30 years out of date. The whole place was kind of creepy. We admitted we had gotten stuck and we asked if there was a tow truck company we could call. They pulled out a phone book. Again, this was before cell phones or the internet. 
and started talking to each other. It wasn't a Nashville phone book, though. Some little township. A population that couldn't have been more than a hundred from the handful of white pages. But the book had dozens of yellow pages of nothing but tow truck companies. If you're unfamiliar, white pages were people and yellow pages were companies. There were literally hundreds of tow truck companies for this town too small to appear on the map. The attendants had a friendly debate about whose turn it was to come get a car out of the mud. They decided to skip over the company who was theoretically next because there had been some sort of problem with them the last time they were called out for a tow. They made a decision about who to call and let mom use their phone. More weirdness, creepiness intensifies. It was still storming, though less now. The tow truck arrived maybe five minutes later. Brilliant white, not a speck of dirt or a drop of mud on it. I have seen vehicles in a new car lot that were dirtier than this thing. Two young men in the truck were also dressed like they had just stepped out of the 1950s. Freshly polished patent leather shoes without a drop of mud on them. Starched white shirts, paper hats, bow ties. We hiked across the street and next door to the mud pit where our car was stuck. The tow truck guys were horrified. They almost got out of the mud, they said to each other repeatedly. The subtext from their shocked tone was clear. No one must ever, ever escape the mud pit on their own. These people would have to take some sort of action to make sure no one else got as close as we did to escaping. They towed our car out. Easy peasy. We all went back to the gas station and paid the tow truck drivers for their service. The drivers let the gas station attendants know that my mom and I almost made it out of the mud on our own. The attendants were horrified and shocked by this. By now, we were getting really big Uncanny Valley vibes from all four of these men. And not just them. The whole place was too clean, too brightly lit, too strangely out of date. It was a surprisingly good facsimile of a small town rest stop populated by real humans, just in the wrong decade. Almost perfect, in fact. We were definitely in creepy town. If these guys were human, there was something seriously off about them. If they weren't, they almost had their ordinary human act down pat. The tow truck drivers went off and the attendants turned all super friendly again and asked my mom and I if we were going to stay the night in the hotel across the road. They got so excited that we might spend the night here. They talked about how great it was. Mom and I made non-committal noises and returned to the car. On our way back, I said, we are not staying here tonight. She agreed wholeheartedly. The rain is finally letting up, so we were really excited to get back out on the road. We drove straight back out onto the interstate. Didn't pass go, didn't collect $200, didn't even go near the Creepy Towns Motel parking lot. We drove down I-40 to the very next exit. It was maybe five miles. We pulled off and spent the night in a kind of crappy but refreshingly ordinary motel. At least it's not the Bates Motel, we joked. The rest of the trip went really well. Several days later, on the way home, my mom and I decided we really wanted to see this creepy town in the light of day. I mean, it couldn't have been that weird, could it? Heading back up I-40, we passed the exit where we actually did spend the night on the way down. We could see the hotel, the exit number matched the notes, everything. Then we started looking for the next exit. The exit to Creepy Town. Should have been about five miles along with an overpass. Five miles pass. No exit. No overpass. Five more miles later before we find the next exit off of I-40. It's the one I had marked as being right before the storm first hit. In short, Creepy Town doesn't exist. The exit doesn't exist. The gas station doesn't exist. I've traveled I-40 many times since, often remarking, hey, there's that non-existent exit where the weird storm hit and we went to Creepy Town. And then there's the exit where we actually did spend the night. To this day, and we've looked multiple times, 
we have never found Creepy Town Exit. In fact, we've never found a single exit between those two points ever again. I have no explanation. A couple of months ago, while I was sitting in a car wash, my music stopped, which always occurs when a call comes through. I looked at the media system to see who was ringing. It said, ma'am, M-A-M. I went to answer and nobody was there and the call ended. Ma'am isn't really common here, but it is what I called my mom and how she signed off on her birthday cards. She was never ever stored in my phone as ma'am though. It was always under dad and it still is because they only had one landline between them. No missed or received calls on my phone were logged during that time. The thing is, my mom's been dead for a while now. Three years, in fact. I shrugged it off as stress, except yesterday it happened again when I was driving. My husband was in the passenger seat and he saw it with his own eyes. It occurred three times. The first time, the line was open for at least a minute but nobody spoke. The second time, a bit shorter, and the third time, mere seconds. My husband is a complete skeptic, but he can't explain this, and neither can I. I did think maybe it was a spoofed number, but again, there's no record of the calls. It's like they never happened. This encounter didn't happen to me, but to my mother. A couple of months ago, my great aunt was in the hospital with the virus. At first, it seemed like she was stable and would recover, but things took a turn for the worst about a week in. She had a heart attack, her lungs became damaged beyond repair, and she was brain dead, being kept alive by a machine. My cousins had to make a decision to keep her on it or let her pass. They went with the latter and she passed away. Due to the fact that she had the virus, my immediate family and I were unable to visit her as she was three hours away and we didn't have the means to travel there, especially on such short notice. We were kept in the loop through phone calls from our family members though. Although my mother managed to keep her composure during all of this, she took her death pretty hard as she was really close with her growing up, and it was one of the few extended family members that she still talked to who was alive. Personally, for me, I hadn't spoken with her for quite a few years prior to this, but I do have great memories spending time with her during my childhood and teenage years. It's sad to think that so many of my family members growing up have now passed away. She had two dogs that my family and I took in, as my cousins were unable to. They were a mess when they first came into my house, as their last memories of my aunt were being rushed out of her apartment to the hospital, sparking anxiety in them, and, and being brought to a new home with people they haven't seen in well over a decade was a bit anxiety provoking. I'm happy to report that they have acclimated to our home very well, and we've all been doing our absolute best to give them a happy and healthy life. A few weeks after the funeral, my mother was sleeping and was awoken by a phone call around midnight. She sleepily looked at her phone and jolted awake when she saw that it was my aunt calling. I'll be paraphrasing this, but here's essentially what my mother told me. When she answered the phone, she was greeted by my aunt and my mother immediately asked, how are you calling me? To which my aunt replied, don't worry about it. My aunt went on to tell her that she wanted to let her know that she was okay and was now with several family members that had passed long before she did. Her husband, her mother, her sister, and so on. 
She wanted to let my mother know that she was very thankful for taking her dogs in and was glad to see that they were being well taken care of. She asked my mother to deliver a message to my cousin, her closest daughter. She wanted her to know that she didn't feel any pain when she passed and that she was in a better place now. My mother understood and told her that she would tell her. My aunt thanked her, said she loved her, and the call ended. My mother is pretty open to the paranormal, so she wasn't too freaked out by this, and was very thankful and happy to have heard from her. The next morning, she delivered the message to my cousin. She teared up on the phone and thanked my mother for telling her. Now, I do recognize that this could very easily have just been a dream or some kind of hallucination on my mother's part. However, she swears that she was very awake and very aware during the phone call. She was walking around the house as she was on the phone with my aunt. And my sister was awake at the time and confirmed that she heard my mom walking around the house and having a conversation. My mom also has no history of sleepwalking or hallucinating for as long as I've been alive. And I'm assuming before that too. I personally believe that it was my aunt contacting her, and it makes me happy knowing she's out there in a better place with the people that she loves. This happened a couple of weeks after my dad passed. It was the week that I had gotten a new couch. I fell asleep on it while watching TV. I awoke to the telephone ringing in the middle of the night. I got up and walked around my coffee table, picked up the phone and said, Hello? It was my father. He sounded as chipper as ever. He said, Hello, my dear. I told him that he was dead. He said, Oh, no, dear. I'm just here swimming with the dolphins. After hearing him say that, I vaguely remembered walking on a beach and talking with him, a memory I'd nearly forgotten. The next day, I received a phone call from some friends who were down in Mexico. I had given them some of his ashes and told them to disperse them somewhere they thought he would like. As she was talking, I abruptly interrupted her to tell her my story. We hadn't spoken about the ashes at all in this conversation. She went silent for a full minute and finally said, You are never going to believe this. She and her husband had chartered a boat the day previous. They had asked the captain to stop so that they could release their friend who had passed. The captain obliged. Not a minute after they released my father, the dolphins showed up and started to play in the water. They stayed and watched them for an hour. So, yeah, my dad literally was swimming with the dolphins. 